Hey guys, it's good to see you tonight. I hope that everything is going well with you. Uh, we are actually going to be continuing with our study on reliving acts in a 21st century world. And last week we looked at verses 1 through 8 and we looked at a lot of different things, not only talking about the authorship and the introduction into the book, but we also looked at the Holy Spirit promise that was given to the apostles. And we also looked at some very detailed uh, instructions that Jesus gave the apostles not to leave Jerusalem and until they received the promise of the Father. And that was all talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, what was actually going to be taking place there in Acts chapter 2. We talked about all of that. And so tonight, what I would like to do for the next 30 minutes, I hope that you'll take out your Bible, that your paper and your pen, and you'll uh, study with me as we continue with this study tonight. Now, let's go ahead and pick up right here in our text in Acts chapter 1. We're going to be starting in verse number 9, and we're going to get through as much as we possibly can tonight, but we'll stop whenever time uh, has ended. In verses 9 through 11, we have the account here. He's building everything up for the apostles. There's a reason why he's there at the Mount of Olives. Uh, there's a reason why he is... Uh, he has taken all of them there because this was a very special and very specific place for them is what we talked about last week. He talked about the, the, um, the destruction of Jerusalem there, Matthew 24, right here on the Mount of Olives. We're also talking here about uh, where he was transfigured there in Matthew chapter 17. And now this is also where he was betrayed and now he's going to be ascending up into heaven at this particular moment. So let's go ahead and look right here at verse number 9 as we begin tonight. We read, Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Now, as we think about this ascension, you know, I think it's very interesting whenever you look at the whole entire gist of the Bible. You have the Old Testament pointing to the gospel account saying that the Messiah is coming. Then you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John where they are saying there that Jesus is now here but then all of a sudden in Acts chapter 1 all the way through the rest of the book you have there where he says that Jesus is going to be returning which we can easily go into a deep study on uh, the second coming of Christ and when that's going to be and all that we can go back to Matthew chapter 24 verse 36 where he says of that day and hour knows no man but the father only whenever you think about uh, the how he's going to be returning, well, that's answered right here in Acts chapter 1 in our text in verses 9 through 11. Remember what the two individuals said that were uh, wearing white apparel. Notice verse number 11 right here with me. When you look here, he says, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taking up uh, into heaven will so come in like manner. And you need to underline that. What do you mean in like manner? He says, just as you saw him go into heaven. Well, how did he, how did he go up into heaven? Look at verse number nine. He says, now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up. Now watch this. What received him out of their sight? A cloud. Now, this is something that was going to be very, very important for the apostles to understand is whenever he ascended back up into heaven, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God to reign in his kingdom and things of that nature. But I want you to understand something as well. Jesus' mission was completed and therefore was left into the hands of the apostles. Now that's very, very important for us to understand because now Jesus has left his mission for his people to carry on his whole entire purpose and I think it's very interesting to note that as we start thinking about this second coming of Christ 
we see here that he was taken up in a cloud, that the cloud received him up out of their sight. And he says, in like manner, you saw him go up. He's also going to be returning again. Now, this goes right along with other passages as well. If you look right here with me in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, in verse 16 and 17, he says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, watch what happens right here in verse 17. Then, he, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them where? In the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Will the Lord ever step foot on this earth again? My friend, that's, that's not the case. That goes against so many teachings that are actually taught out here in the religious world today. We have to realize that our Lord is going to be coming back in the air. If it's not the case, then guess what, friends? What you read right here in Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, and what you read right here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, is then a lie. But we understand that in, uh, in the book of Titus, that it's impossible for God to lie. And that's what we have to keep in mind, that we have got to either believe this or believe the world. I would rather believe this since this came from God. And I hope you are the same way. So we see the ascension of Christ being taken place here, but then all of a sudden, in verse number 12, we have the apostles in the upper room. Now, this whole upper room business was something that was going to be in a preparation stage of everything that's going to be taking place in chapter 2. Now, I want you to notice what happens right here in verses 12 through 14. It says, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. Now, what did Jesus already say right here in Acts chapter 1? He already told them in verse number 4, where he says there, And he assembled together and commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. Did they obey? Absolutely they did. They went straight back in verse number 12, right back into the city of Jerusalem. And now notice this. It says a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went unto the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Now, I want you to notice something just real quick. They obeyed Jesus. They went back into the city of Jerusalem, and there's where you're going to find that they're going to be staying. But I want you to also notice the fact that not only do you see here that they went back, it also names the 11 apostles. Now, why is there not 12? Because what just took place? After the betrayal of Jesus, there was a man by the name of Judas. Now, by the way, this is not the same Judas as what you're reading here in the text. Judas was the one that, a little bit later on in this text, you're going to find that he was being referred to as the one who went and hung himself and everything because he was, uh, he was overwhelmed with sadness and remorse and things of that nature. And so after he betrayed Christ, he tried to go back to the priest and give the money back, and they wouldn't receive it. And therefore, because of that, they went ahead, he went ahead and went and hung himself. So now there's remaining 11 apostles, which is going to be setting the scene for what's about to be taking place in verse number 15 through the rest of the chapter, whenever they are choosing this new apostle. But I want us to understand a few things that are going on right now. I want you to notice, number one, the Sabbath day's journey. Now, when you start thinking about a Sabbath day's journey, what does that mean? Well, uh, Erdman's Bible Dictionary defines really what a Sabbath day's journey was all about. There was a law in the Old Testament that basically said that on the Sabbath day, there was a limit to how long that you could actually walk outside the city walls. And this is basically what it is. The uh, rabbinic interpretation from the rabbis set the limit of Sabbath traveling at 2,000 cubits or 1,000 yards beyond the borders of the town in which one is spending the Sabbath. Now, this Sabbath was every Saturday, or our Saturday, 
And basically what it was about is that every sixth day they were to rest. Now, it, I, think it's, um, I think it's very interesting to note that God made the Sabbath for the people and saying that I want to set you limitations. I want to set you limitations to the point, or I, I know I just said the sixth day, it's actually the seventh day, okay? Going all the way back to Genesis chapter 2. But I want you to notice this. He set the limit for the individuals so that they could not do excessive work. And really, they weren't supposed to be doing any work at all. They were to be resting because God knew that man needed rest. And so with that being the case, understanding the Sabbath day's journey is what we just read right here in uh, verse number 12. This is what we're talking about. Remember that map that I showed you, how it showed there the Temple Mount, and then you had the Kidron Valley right in the base of it separating the, the Mount of Olives from Jerusalem? That's what we're talking about. It was not that long of a distance, but it was also separated from Jerusalem. Now, I want you to notice something else. The very next thing you read about is that th when they had entered, they went up into the upper room. Now, this upper room was something that is very, very unique because this upper room, there were some buildings in the first century that looked just like this. And what you'll see right here is that this room would be right up here. It would be a very secluded room, but also at the very same time, a very open room. Now that room is gonna be very, very important for the reason that how many people were actually in here? If you look at verse number 15, it says there that in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120. So a big open room like this was necessary for the large gathering. This is something that they would actually go to for seclusion. This is where they would go to in order to have special things. Remember there in Matthew chapter 26, whenever uh, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, you'll find there that whenever they asked Jesus, where would you want us to partake of the Passover? If you recall the instructions that were given there, <coughs> Excuse me. He says, I want you to go to, into the city. I want, to meet you. I want you to meet a certain man and tell him that the Lord is wanting to, to, um, to partake of the Lord's Supper or the Passover at that particular time. And then on top of that, he says, I want you to go and he's going to go into an upper room. And there is where we're going to be meeting. So Jesus actually instituted the Lord's Supper right here in Matthew 26 in an upper room that looks similar to this. So just wanted to give you a good picture of really what all that is all about. So something very interesting within our text as well. If you go back, look at verse number 14. Verse number 14. Now as we're going down through this, we're going to be bringing out some different doctrines that are being taught, whether they be erroneous or whether they be true or whatever, just a little study of certain things as we go throughout this text so you can see how you can utilize this text for your advantage to defend the truth. But in verse number 14 we have here, it says, then these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. Now, who's he talking to? He's talking about the 11 apostles. And now all of a sudden he says, now alongside with them, it says with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Now there is a teaching that is out here talking about the doctrine of Mary. And and when they talk about the doctrine of Mary, they glorify Mary because she was the virgin uh, that basically brought about the, the birth of the Savior and things. But they also add a lot more on top of that. They teach that Mary was a perpetual virgin. It's simply meaning this, that, that she never knew a man. She didn't even know Joseph or anything of that nature. And therefore, Jesus was her only child and therefore, Jesus did not have any brothers or sisters or anything of that sort. But I've got a question to ask. Does that even fit anywhere within Scripture? Well, let's take a look at a few things as we look at this. Now, notice this. It says, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Now, watch this. In Matthew chapter 1, verses 24 and 25, I want you to notice something. 
if she actually was a perpetual virgin, simply means till the day she died, she did not know a man. And what we're talking about is knowing him sexually. Okay, now I want you to notice what happens here. In Matthew chapter 1, this is at the announcement to Joseph that Mary was with child. It says, Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife, and watch this next phrase, and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus. Now, I want you to just see this very, very quickly. It says there that he did not touch her um, in that way, in the sexual way, until after she had brought forth, now watch this, her firstborn. If that was her only child, then there's no reason for it to be a firstborn son. It says that he did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son. So did she actually stay as a perpetual virgin? Absolutely not. On top of this, you also have in Matthew chapter 12. Now notice this. Remember the account of where um, Mary came to Jesus and was trying to get him away from the crowd? Now watch this. She wasn't by herself in this account. Now watch what happens here. While he was still speaking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and brothers stood outside seeking to speak with him. Then one said to him, look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you. Now, Mary and his brothers, the community, the disciples even acknowledged that he had brothers. Now, not only did he have brothers, but we also see in Matthew 13 that he also had sisters. Because whenever he came into his own city and started preaching, they were not receiving him because they had this uh, thought process about him. Notice what it says right here, Matthew 13, 55 and 56. Is this not the carpenter's son? Talking about Jesus. He says, is not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? So this whole teaching that Mary was a perpetual virgin and that he did not have any brothers or sisters, that he was the only child and things that there's, is so false according to Scripture, friends. And so I thought it would be necessary for us to look into this. But now let's go back to Acts chapter 1 as we continue our study. When you look at verses 15 down through verse number 26, we have here the new apostle chosen. Now, we're going to read this all the way through, and then we're going to go back and make some application, okay? Whenever you look at verse number 15 beginning, it says, And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether the number of names was about a hundred and twenty, and said, Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity. And falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his entrails or intestines gushed out. Now watch this. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem, so that field is called in their own language, Akel Dama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his dwelling place be desolate, and let no one live in it, and let another take his office. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to the day that he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they proposed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, uh, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, you, O Lord, you know, uh, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, 
that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Now, as we go back and we start looking at everything that has just taken place, we see here by uh, just a summary that basically Peter is right here now looking to fulfill this or refill this position of the apostleship so that they can be 12 once again. At the same time, Judas has died to replace Judas in his transgression. And so alongside of this, he gives not only um, the fulfillment saying that this had to be done, this had to be fulfilled. At the same time, I'm going to now give you the qualifications of these individuals that are even qualified to even partake in this type of position. And then they all of a sudden start casting lots. Now, we're going to talk about every single bit of this, but I want you to notice something right here in verse number 16. We've got to ask this question, which I know a lot of times people in the religious world will ask. And it almost seemed like this went against Judas's free will. Now, as we think about the doctrine of free will in connection to this situation, let's look at verse number 16 and see really what they are saying. It says, Men and brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke uh, before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. Now, I, I want you to notice something just real, real quick. People will read this type of text and say, well, it sort of seemed like, well, if it had to be done, then Judas was already chosen to do this task. Therefore, he was actually out of, um, of choice in this matter. Does God ever predetermine somebody in that way? Does he ever predetermine an individual in saying that you are chosen to do this matter and therefore you cannot go against it? That for some odd reason, God robotically places this individual into life and therefore he has no choice in the matter. Did Judas have a choice? Why did then God choose this individual to be the one to betray the Son of God? Well, the way that happens is that God, you can even see this throughout the book of Romans, especially like Romans chapter 9. That God chose certain people to do, their, do his will for a reason. Not that they didn't have a choice, but God knew the hearts of all men. Which remember there, remember there in verse number 24, remember what he said there? And then, uh, then they prayed and said, you, O Lord, who know the hearts of all. The fact is, friends, that God chose Judas to do this because he knew what decision he was going to make. He knew what he was going to do with his life. I know we've said in numerous times that God knows whenever he looks at our life, he's already seeing the front cover, the middle, all the pages, and he's seeing the back cover all in one glance. He knows what we're going to do. He already knows what decisions we're going to be making. And so because of that, God then did choose Judas to betray because he knew he would. I think it's important there. Remember there in John chapter 13, whenever we have Jesus washing the disciples' feet? And right after that, it says there, after he instituted the Lord's Supper with them, it says, then Satan filled his heart. And from that moment forward, he looked how he might betray him. Did Satan fill his heart, you know, involuntarily? No, that, that, that would be... That'd be ludicrous. The fact is that God knew what Jesus was going to do, and his greed is what led him to do what he did. And so with that being the case, we can see just simply in our text in verse number 16, not only does he say there that this scripture had to be fulfilled, but I want you to notice certain things. I want you to look at verse number 18. When you look here, it says, Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity. Now, iniquity is another word for sin. And if you go to 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, he says, 
that uh, sin is lawlessness, and we understand what that means. Lawlessness, it's a going against of the law of God. Now, sin is something that you do. It's not something you inherit. It's not something that you have placed within yourself. It is something that you do. We can go to James chapter 1 there where temptation is what leads an individual to sin. But I want you to notice something, though. I want you to turn over there to James chapter 1 because I want you to really look at this with your own eyes. Remember there in verse number 13 of James chapter 1, it says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he, tempt him, uh, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it, brings forth, uh, it uh, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is grown, brings forth death. So I want you to understand, what's the main source of sin itself? Sin comes from our own desires. We have no one to blame for our own actions besides ourselves. If we decide to sin, it's because our inner desires is what caused us to sin. So it's important for us to notice this. And you can even see this all the way through this whole entire text right here. Verse number 18, the wages of iniquity, the, the wages of sin that had been taking place. You look right here in verse 25, to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas, by transgression or sin, fell that he might go to his own place. My friends, listen. When we think about this, he is making very, very clear that he had the free will. But by his free will, he chose to do wrong, and God used that. So with that being the case, I think it's important for us to also realize that there's another subject that is brought up with this as well, and that is the subject of, number one, the doctrine of falling from grace. There are those that are out there that believe that once you're saved, you're always saved. And if that really be the case, if... Once we are saved, we're always saved, that we cannot ever fall from grace to the point of losing our salvation. This fact right here in, uh, in the account of Judas is a beautiful picture that t teaches against that. They say, well, if in the end they did find out that they were, that they're lost and they were never saved to begin with, uh, well, that's, that's their way of really justifying themselves. But I want you to notice something. In verse number 17 of our text, notice what he says here. For he, talking about Judas, was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. I've got to ask this question. Was Judas an apostle? Yes or no? And if he was, which is what we can see there in Matthew chapter 10, whenever he chose the 12 apostles, and he also says in chapter 10 that he also gave them powers to do certain things. Now, these were the miraculous gifts. They were able to do like the casting out of demons. They were able to uh, cast out sickness. They were able to heal people. They were able to do all these things. But I want you to also notice this. How were they able to do that? A miracle is the working of God against nature through the instruments of man. Now, I want you to notice what I just said. When you're talking about miraculous acts, you're talking about miracles, the workings of God through man to go and do things that are against the laws of nature. Well, with that being the case, he says he obtained a part in this ministry. He was numbered with us in verse number 18, we also see here that he says, Now this man purchased the field, which is wages of iniquity. He sinned. In verse number 25, it says, By transgression failed, that he might go to his own place. We need to understand that, friends. Judas was once with God, but by transgression failed. 
and therefore went to his own place, speaking of hell. Now, we're going to have to stop right here for our study tonight. But I want you to uh, just continue reading on through the rest of chapter 1. And then go ahead and read chapter 2 for next week. Because we're going to really start getting into the accounts of what took place there on the day of Pentecost, which is going to be something very, very awesome to really study. Because it is truly the hub of the Bible. Would you stop and pray with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we love you so much. And we ask, Father, that you please be with us as we have studied this, this, this book of yours. That we've studied these things. And we ask, Father, that you please help us as we apply these things to our lives. Help us, Father, to stay safe. Help us, Father, to uh, stay healthy throughout this uh, sickness that is going around. We ask, Father, that you please just take this sickness away if it be your will. Please help everyone in the world find comfort in you. Help all of us to always lean on you for guidance. Help us throughout our lives to be what you would have for us to be. And, Father, if there is someone who's watching this program tonight that has never obeyed the gospel, we hope and pray that you will work on them, that you will help them to really want to put you on in baptism, to be a part of your church, having changed their lives. Father, we know you can work in our hearts, and we ask that you please break our hearts so that we are always uh, softened to your will, that you will help us to always live for you each and every day. Father, we love you. We ask that you always forgive us, always bless us, we love you so much. Thank you most of all for your son and sending him down for the, uh, to be put on the cross to save us from our sins. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you, friends, so very much for watching. And Lord willing, I'll be seeing you very soon. Church, family, I miss you. I love you. Can't wait to see you again. But until then, may God bless. Thank you. Have a great night.